identity, how you could run your own identity server and use that to authenticate against other services like Google or Microsoft or whatever, um, and how you could enable this uh, trust relationship, a topic that is rather complicated, rather um, very interesting in, in the current times, and yeah, all, all more I'm not qualified to talk this, so we have two speakers with Rick van Rijn and Henry Manson. So please give them a very, wild, very warm round of applause. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a very, very small business. I do stuff with cryptography and open source protocols. I'm probably the only one here. Um, but over the years, I've constantly be annoyed by how poor authentication has been organized, uh, also in open source, actually, in open protocols. I think it should be trivial, as trivial as DNS is. And I know DNS is complex, but for an end user, it's not noticeable. And that's the level of understanding you want to reach, because then people don't mess it up so easily. And the DNS is quite simple, right? You have an authority defining the names, exporting them over the network, and there's a resolver that can actually verify, yes, these are the names, and thanks to DNSSEC, it's even secure. Um, why don't we do this with authentication? Um, and if we can, please give users maximum control over their online presence, because I don't like if somebody else decides who I am and whether I'm allowed to continue to exist or whether I'm allowed to be removed from the scene. Um, I don't know if anyone of you ever deleted an account for somebody who perished, who died, and that's terrible. You have to jump through all sorts of hoops with the third-party providers. Also, um, if you're a security officer in a company, you would like to set a certain security level and say always two-factor authentication, for example. What we see now is that service providers, like GitHub, for example, decides you need to start using second factor authentication because we think it's important, but as a, as a user, you want to make that decision. Um, um, so, basically, what we've been working on over the past few years is something that we bring to users, explain to users, bring your own identity. You're just someone at your own domain name, like you have an email address under your own, own domain name. But how we can make this happen with identity? This should be trivial, and it can be. Because every relying party connect, can connect securely to any other domain using DNS, Dane, and TLS. We have the infrastructure to know who we're talking to, to what domain we're talking. And there are standard SFE records for quite a few identity providers. There's Kerberos, there's LDAP, there's Diameter. Diameter is radius, but designed for this sort of crossover thing, so it's the easier choice in this case. But there are standard SFE records for this sort of thing. Um, that together means you can trust, uh, you can find an identity provider under someone else's domain and trust it. And um, this identity provider then, of course, has the prerogative on the usernames, whether John exists and whether Joe exists. It can be trivial. In practice, it's far from trivial. I, I'm looking at a really big screen trying to read it. I shouldn't. Um, yeah, I know. Um, so, credential handling is very often done in applications, and that's a problem because an application programmer has quite different ideas and wishes and things he wants to do than a security programmer. So, what we end up with is passwords, the lowest common denominator. We've been doing that all the time. I can't make a mistake if I do that too. Um, shouldn't we just Tell the application programmer, we authenticated this guy, this identity you can trust. That should be enough. Um, credentials managed by foreign parties, I think, are a disaster. Um, you can't withdraw, you can't uh, expire, you can't... Why can't I make an identity that expires in three weeks? Ideal for web shops, right? Also, if other parties manage them, they need a recovery protocol. You can't have a local administrator overriding things. 
So you need some mechanism and some jumping through hoops to do this, and you end up supplying communication details, which means a privacy uh, problem. So, um, and there are many solutions that look like the sort of thing we're doing, but I found that most of them um, are web only, or in other ways protocol specific, but usually that leads to web only. Meaning IMAP has to reinvent the wheel, meaning uh, just about any protocol has to do it again. So, um, in terms of technology, I use, I don't say bring your own identity because that's like how users would experience it, but we speak of realm crossover. And there are ways of doing this for quite a few common authentication protocols already. And we made small extensions to existing standards and could then make this happen. SASL, in case you don't know it, it means that the server sends you a list of mechanisms you might lose. Use it might be something like plain text or it might be GSS API or it might be Digest MD5. It just gives you a list and the client chooses with which mechanism to, to uh, use. And then they start passing tokens back and forth, interpreted through that mechanism, until the server says, yeah, you're welcome, or no, you're not. Um, this is a very generic thing, and it allows you to negotiate what you want to do. You might go for a simple password, or you might go for something as fancy as Kerberos. Kerberos, in case you think it's old-fashioned, let me rephrase that into old and fashionable. Um, it works with symmetric keys, so in a trivial way, it's always been quantum-proof, and it's already been designed to pr prove uh, a campus with curious, innovative students. Uh, pretty much what we have on the, on the internet today, where everybody's challenging security all the time. And it's withstood the test of time, with, of course, crypto updates. Um, and lastly, certificates can be used for TLS signing encryption, and we also see ways of doing realm crossover for that. So I'm going to talk about these three realm crossover mechanisms, and Henry later on is going to do one of them. Um, so for SASL, um, SASL is embedded in just about any uh, authentication protocol. It's amazing, it's almost everywhere. So if you can port, support SASL, it's wonderful. I know HTTP doesn't have SASL, so we built that. Don't worry, we got you covered. Um, and to make this work, we designed a new mechanism for SASL. That's one of the extensions we made. It's a pretty trivial extension that anyone can make, basically. We call it SX over plus. And that's like an end-to-end -end tunnel that wraps around a standard SASL exchange. And I'll show later on why. And um, basically, you have an a server that wants to use something that um, passes this SASL and then, in the end, knows that, you're to that he's talking to John at example.com. So this is from my internet draft, so that's why it's an ASCII art picture. Uh, is it readable? Good, thanks. Um, so let's say the application at hand is email, but keep in mind it could be anything. But let's say we want to have an IMAP server for a group, and it's hosted under some sort of domain somewhere, and John, who has an identity under example.com, wants to use that. And this will be the identity provider for example.com. So John and example.com have some, somewhere, sometime in the past, set up an account. Now, what John does is he says, I want to talk to that IMAP server, and IMAP says, yeah, but you first got to log on, because I need to know whether you can see this group and perhaps it wants to see what mails you've already seen. So it starts a SASL exchange. And what a foreign server does is pretty much it says, OK, I see SX over plus being used. That means I'm not going to resolve the password locally, like web servers very often do. I'm going to pass on the request. And the SX over plus has a beginning where you can see what domain it goes to. So it's passed on to John's domain. It just says example.com, so it knows it can pass it on. And it does all the things I just mentioned, SFE lookup, TLSA, so Dane, and then just passes on the SASL. It just sits in the middle, pretty dumb, just passing back and forth the SASL uh, packages. And at some point, the identity domain says, yep, this is indeed an account that we have, and it's called John. It doesn't say John at example.com, because he knows that. He validated that using the SFE and all that, all that stuff. Um, so the identity domain only says, stick John in front. 
So now the foreign server knows it's talking to John at example.com, it, it can relay back the OK, and everything can happen as it is. So what did we need to do for this? Um, I mentioned we use diameter, and it is like radius, but radius optimized for uh, trusted internal networks, and diameter is more optimized for realm crossover sort of thing, so mutually untrusting domains. So we needed to define a, a couple, three address value pair, uh, attribute value pairs to carry the social content back and forth. That's pretty much all, plus, of course, the SXO for plus mechanism. And we've implemented this stuff, and it works like crazy. As I mentioned, um, we thought it cool to demo this with HTTP, so that's what we'll show you. So we have an authentication mechanism for HTTP that actually passed the SASL. So then you get in this picture um, a web browser speaking SASL over HTTP to, to a web server, and that in the back end can use the identity domain. And something else I'm also doing now is I'm building it into PAM, so you could use in sudo, for example, or in uh, the console access for container, for example. Um, that also means your very simple small container doesn't need to know what counts. It can just forward it to a trusted internal um, node. Um, Kerberos is entirely different, but I think this is the gold path for, for, for what you want to do, because Kerberos does single sign-on. You log on in the beginning of the day, you get a sort of meta ticket, and you use it for the rest of the day to get additional tickets without effort. Um, Kerberos even has Realm crossover built in, but it's static. Meaning, I ask my uh, Kerberos controls, the key, it's called the key distribution center, so I ask my Kerberos Realm controller, please hand me a ticket for a service I now want to see. And he says, oh gosh, I don't know that one. But I know the, a Realm that does, so it says, I'm going to give you a key that I share with that Realm, and you can use that to ask that Realm for control. So then you have the client identity uses um, its, its own realm, and the service is at another realm. And this is Realm Crossover, but it uses static keys that have been pre-configured, like, shall we say, uh, the name of my cat? Yeah, let's do that, and then it's set. All we had to do to, do, to extend this is to um, basically say, first of all, if you ask for a service that I don't know, I want to know what realm it is, what Kerberos realm, so what domain. So it needs to be able to look that up in DNS. Well, that's a text record. It's pretty simple, um, except when you need to pass it through ITF. But um, it's a pretty simple idea. Um, and then the next thing is these two Kerberos servers, when they see, gosh, you're asking me for a service through DNS. I can look up what realm it has. But now I need to set exchange a key. So the two uh, key, key uh, distribution centers, so the, the realm controllers for Kerberos, get in contact and do a key exchange, which basically is a key extraction facility that's standardized in RFC 5C05. Uh, um, basically, they use the master key, add some seeding, and add some strings, and that ends up being a, a, a key that the two endpoints have without ex explicitly passing it. It's a lovely mechanism. And from then on, it might be for three uh, weeks, for example, and the client realm would do that for um, um, all, everyone in the client realm can use these keys to address any service in the service realm. And of course, it might also be done the other way around, but that's independent. Um, so this is a really efficient uh, system and also covers bloody fast. So uh, after the first has come through, you really uh, have very fast access to a remote service. And this can surface the internet. That's pretty much the idea. The entire internet can use this mechanism and use Kerberos for all their authentication. That's something Kerberos can't do now. So those are a few very simple things we added to make this possible. Uh, certificates, we haven't done much on this, but we understand how to do this. Um, certificates have these funny names in their subject, right? they're actually an LDAP location. So they would look like user ID is John, and maybe organizational unit, and organization, and whatever. And then the domain is split in a number of components. The domain is very long. Now. I need to look, walk along and for it. But this is basically a location in LDAP. 
And that is standardized. That is just something we don't do very often, but it is a standard. And even if you know the domain part, it has been standardized that you put LDAP TCP in front, find a, find a SFE record, and then look up the LDAP server. Of course, LDAP can be encrypted with TLS after start TLS call, and then you can continue with, the, um, with, with Dane to make sure that you're talking to the right one. So yet again, the same structures, DNSSEC, Dane, SFE records, and you're there. You can look up things. Because these are locations for objects, and they may, may have attributes with X509 certificates, PGP keys, so you can use sign in your encryption with someone you haven't talked to before. And the interesting thing is, it uses a slightly different name, but OpenPGP has this installed. If you use minus R on PGP you can, or GPG, you can actually pull in, uh, based on the email address, pull in that key, if they set this up. Uh, Realm crossover can really be done very easily. Um, and an extra idea that we are trying to get through, and I think people are listening, is why should I use an external authority to sign the users in my domain? I would very much like to be able to just publish a root certificate for, so for a local CA, and publish that uh, with a Dane record, and client Dane could do that sort of things. It's all in the pipeline, we'll see. Imagine. Mail servers, they talk to each other, and when one domain sends something to another domain, um, they need to trust the identity that's been supplied to them. Imagine adding authentication here. That definitely makes it more difficult to spam, and it also makes it very pleasant to select because between the ones you trust and the ones you may trust or may not trust. So it can make you switch between white listing and great listing in your mail server. It can be really va valuable. And Email, of course, was designed in the time that everybody trusted everyone. Um, with 32 computers online, that was safe, I suppose. Um, but you can actually expand on that quite well. And um, basically use the DC systems to retrofit more security on SMTP. Uh, SIP, that's used for calling. Um, not just audio, but it's generally used for telephony and video calls and all of that with a pleasant thing that, unlike all those platforms that we have, like Zoom, um, if you use IPv6, it's very trivial to make use to use direct connections. So just call recketoperfortress.nl, you will be connected. Um, imagine adding Realm Cross over there. You would know who's calling, because you could check. Um, you would know if somebody is scamming you, and you might even look up information in their enum records, for example, to see what kind of person it is, and. Um, you might even find key material there, so you could start an encrypted call. Helpful, I would say. Um, HTTP, well, Henry is going to show all, all about that, as I think that's one of the lovely, yeah, he came up with a wonderful way of building this into Mozilla, using a standard that is new, but that was already in Mozilla, but in theory it can be rolled out in all the browsers as well, but they also adopt this new standard. Um, doing this for doing SASL for auth uh, HTTP authentication means you could add Realmcross over there, bring your own di identity, so log on to Gmail if they, if they would support this, of course, but log into Gmail using your own identity managed under your own domain. And you want to stop using it, you just delete your identity on your own identity provider. If you want aliases, if you want to do stuff with groups, whatever you want, you're in control. If you lose your password, you go to your local admin, you have it changed locally on your domain. I think that beats having to having these 30 seconds expiration that Gmail uses while they don't implement gray listing properly. Um, and here too, um, I mentioned that applications are um, um, applications have problems with uh, um, 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 getting this getting to the information. A web server can easily set a number of environment variables and pass the information over to scripts. So we made a simple protocol to allow you to, if you need to implement diameter in every single server, it's going to be a hassle because diameter isn't easy. So we made a very simple wrapper protocol that basically says we've got open authentication, close requests and responses. They can be multiplexed. 
and it, this turns out to be very easy to build into an application. We also made, instead of just a protocol, we also made a library to use this, and we have demonstrations for synchronous, uh, threaded, and event-driven applications. So forked, fork-based, thread-based, and event-based. And this, um, usually we copy these things and get things working very quickly. And what this assumes is that within your domain you have a central node that runs diameter and quick, uh, quick diacetyl connects to, to that node. So you have one place that basically is the client for authentication. And um, all the others um, basically just use that. So we have had funding, but we can also hand out some of that to other people. And I'm very, pr pleasant, I'm very pleased to say that. Um, our work on Sassel Works is well, a project name we had. We did all sorts of nut and bolt work on Sassel, and it's been sponsored by Analnet, including the PAM module I just talked about. Um, Realm Crossover, uh, as, as a mechanism, has mostly been sponsored by NGI Pointer, which is a European Union project. European Union doesn't really like to offer you Facebook logins. And if I have to be honest, I don't very much like to say, Facebook is now going to decide that I can log on to this site that holds all this personal information about me. Somehow I think that's challenging them too much, offering them too much. Now, some of these uh, NGI pointer funds are remaining. And um, as I said, with the quick die Cecil, it's really easy to add, to make a modulus extension to your server and to actually implement this. So if you're interested in this, we can probably help you with some funding. So contact us, contact me, uh, for example. And what we'll be looking for is things with the most impact. So if it's generic, it's interesting. If it's a frugal proposal, we can do more of those. And if it ends up in the core distributions, we say, hooray. Um, so if you think this is interesting, if you um, want to implement it, talk to us. And um, That's where I uh, hand off the microphone to Henri. Um, if you download these slides, then there are many links to uh, documentation and backgrounds. Um, I won't go over those now, but if you download them, there's extra goodies. Good, now to train LibreOffice. <laughs> Terrible program. Hello, hello. Yeah. Uh, I will continue uh, the talk of Rick uh, by demonstrating uh, HTTP social, uh, which uh, Rick introduced already. And uh, it, uh, I have to look up a little bit because this is my first speech. Uh, HTTP social uh, is a new HTTP authentication protocol uh, that's a standardized way to add new HTTP protocols. Internet, as the name already says, it uh, involves uh, that, uh, the social protocol, which allows you to specify the mechanism in the social protocol itself. Uh, so it's, uh, it could be the only HTTP, uh, HTTP authentication protocol yeah, because SASO provides for choosing a mechanism, yeah, while uh, the HTTP authentication protocol contains the mechanism. Yeah, this mo yeah, almost all HTTP authentication mechanisms choose one specific uh, authentication mechanism, and SASO yeah, that, that allows for any mechanism to be used. Uh, uh, HTTP Sassel uh, was invented by the previous speaker, <laughs> uh, with uh, one uh, thing in mind, uh, the Rayan Kassov he just mentioned, and his SX over plus protocol, which will, the, uh, which will be the mechanism you choose when uh, you want to have Rayan over. Uh, but uh, uh, HTTP Sassel also allows for conventional mechanisms to be used, which don't, don't allow for crossover. 
There is a draft for it, uh, and uh, it's shown there, and it will be uh, uh, available on all the slides. Uh, that, that is the last protocol uh, which uh, is, contains the latest updates. Next slide. Uh, here is the, uh, I can do this very hard, this is the demonstration of a conventional HTTP session exchange, the most used one, by the way. Uh, it's uh, very simple. Uh, you try to, uh, out, uh, to, to visit the website and you get, uh, you are not authorized, you have to log in. And then uh, 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 the browser reacts by showing a pop-up uh, that uh, login is required and it shows some real, it's the, the real message, which is always on the top of the uh, top of the pop-up box. And this is uh, something like, uh, now you enter the secret area, something like that. And that's the, uh, the, uh, the realm passed in the www authenticate uh, header. Uh, and uh, the client then responds in base 64 uh, encoding. Uh, it's not encryption, it is just a simple encoding with username and password. And then the, uh, the, the web server checks whether those credentials are correct and they either succeed or not. Next slide. <laughs> this is. Uh, uh, a flow, how it goes with, uh, uh, with our new HTTP social uh, uh, mechanism. And uh, you can see that uh, there is a one extra ping pong, so, I, so to say. And uh, the first authenticate from the web server is, here I have my list of uh, mechanisms I support. Uh, and then uh, you can choose one of them. And the realm is exactly the same realm as show, uh, which is used in the basic uh, in the basic authentication mechanism, this is just something you can show you're now logging in some secret area. And uh, the next, uh, what, what, at that time, uh, this, uh, I will show you in a minute, uh, uh, instead of the standard uh, pop-up box from the browser itself, uh, which is built in all, all modern browsers, uh, we show up, uh, 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 a pop-up box, pop box is shown by an external program, uh, that is not the browser, but an external program, which not allows you to not only allows you to enter the credentials, but also which mechanism you want to use to log on. And that is all, all happening in the ask user on the left side uh, uh, on, of this diagram. And then here you can see uh, as, a, as, a, as a demonstration, uh, the choo user chooses Digest MD5 uh, to, to log on. And then it's almost the same as a conventional, uh, conventional uh, uh, HTTP authentication mechanisms. Uh, just the, uh, just the web server sends challenges which the client has to make a response on. And the only extra parameter we use is the so-called server state, uh, S2S uh, in this diagram. That's something uh, the web server can, uh, the server can send to the client. And the client always has to send the same state back in the next request. And that's your, what you here can see in the, uh, the same uh, string, uh, the same string which is sent by the server and sent back by the client. And then, uh, in the case of Digest and the five, uh, business as usual, uh, then the credentials are checked, and when the credentials are correct, you get uh, an OK or uh, uh, authorization refused. That's the, this slide, and then the most complex one. Hey, this is the one with crossover. And, yeah, uh, uh, it's mooi. Uh, then, uh, uh, it's, the, it's using the same hey, plugin, hey, the same software, but uh, now uh, the server, hey, the clients, not, not select the Digest 25, but the SX Over protocol. But then, hey, there's the, the, my, the pop-up box of the new client program has extra fields which you can fill, fill in. in uh, that are the alias and the client domain fields. And the most important is, of course, the client domain. That's the domain which Rick just talked about, uh, which you want to log on to identify yourself. And the alias is used for uh, showing uh, the entity which the Foreign server, that is the, the middle server in the Rick's diagram, will see. That is, I can authenticate as Henri, but I can, uh, that is, the foreign server can see a totally different uh, identity on the, the identity you want to uh, provide to the server. 
He, dus, en daar zou je in de minuut houden dat pop-up looks pop pop box looks like. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, then he, dus on the first, he, after the client has chosen SX over protocol, it's nice to indicate what's uh, inside the encoded client to server uh, field, he, which you see there. And then, he, just to make it clear a little bit how crossover works, he, that, that contains the client domain you want to log on to. He, not to be confused with the realm which is shown in a pop-up box. He, that is, uh, the, the, he, the client domain you filled in in the pop-up box on the, of the client program. Uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide, hey, because hey, the, here I have the components which are involved in uh, our, uh, our uh, setup, which I will show you in a minute. Hey, here are the, the, this is the, on the left side, on the purple, this, how do you call it, Magenta box, is the native client, hey, which is a C program, which does the real authentication. And uh, I, I built this, and I, fortunately it was possible because uh, uh, browsers have standardized the way uh, plugins work, and one of the possibilities you can do is so-called native mess messaging, which allows a browser plugin, which is the yellow box, in, uh, which runs inside uh, the browser as a, a, Javas as a JavaScript extension. Uh, when you uh, set it up correctly, uh, then the plugin is allowed to talk to an external program. Uh, you have to uh, organize it. You have to or or organize it yourself. So we uh, had not any uh, program can talk to the browser, which would be a huge se security risk. And on the right side, we have a server. It can be an Apache module, but uh, when I first started for NLNet, had to, to, to just so that this concept works, I used, for example, a, a Java servlet to do the, to do the work. And it was, of course, only uh, a, conventional, uh, a conventional mechanism which was then used. And uh, I think uh, everything I mentioned here is done. And uh, yeah, here can, next slide is okay. And, and here, uh, you, maybe you will recognize some of the components which uh, Rick showed in his uh, Realm crossover talk. Because uh, here are the components in the Apache Server in the Identity Provider. These three things, I have no pointer, but the uh, uh, blue, the green, and the red box are the same components which Rick showed in his slide, uh, had, uh, how Ryan Kersov works, had the three parties, the, um, the Apache server contains the 3 diameter client, uh, which talks to possibly a different, uh, a different uh, a 3 diameter server, uh, uh, three different, uh, a server on a different domain, and the uh, free di uh, diameter allows for that. And uh, uh, I will have to have a look on it because it's a little bit complicated. And it rest my heart, but this is... Because the, the Apache module which is used here, it, which is uh, uh, capable of uh, uh, doing the di uh, diameter sussel, is uh, one of the two... Uh, Apache modules I wrote. Uh, I started with a simple one, which really involved that uh, the entire authentication was done in the Apache module or an, on the same server. And uh, the, this module, which allows for to, uh, to, to authenticate on an external diameter server, is called uh, uh, the module for the diameter satchel, which uses what was it? Quick, quick diameter protocol between the uh, blue and the uh, green box. Yeah, that's correct, Rick. Yeah, this is the DSSL protocol, this ES protocol you invented. And uh, this, this is, uh, we have uh, created a demo for this, and then you can really see yeah, that there are three parties, and that uh, yeah, there's a client can log in using its own domain, and then the authentication succeeds, and that is shown on one of the next slides. Uh, yeah, here, here, here you see the, uh, it is on, on, on the Firefox browser, you see the new PubWorks, which uh, replaces the, the PubWorks of the browser, which you all know, uh, which only contains a user and a password field. And here you can see the fields I just talked about, uh, 
Uh, the, the, the first one is uh, very important that you see the same URL as in the browser so that you know which uh, resource you are accessing. And uh, uh, along with the uh, user and password fields, uh, there's a Henri and the four dots, uh, you can see the alias and the your domain fields. And in this uh, login session, I just used conventional login, so I didn't need to use alias and your domain. And I think the next slide shows the... Uh, even kijken. No, no, that is not... Nee, that, that's it, I'm afraid. Because I didn't include... Yeah, that this is all, eh? Yeah, sorry. Then I, uh, so I don't have a picture which includes, uh, yeah, because this is the things I just talked about, yeah, that, uh, that are the features which you can choose. But in, uh, in, uh, in a crossover situation, which you can, we, you can see in the demo we have, on our, uh, we have sticks and we have also uh, uh, virtual machines on which you can see all of this work. And then you can see a, a client domain log on. Yes, I forgot to include that slide. And uh, that's uh, my talk, my first talk, to, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you very much, both of you. Um, we do have some time for questions and answers, so if you line up the, the microphones. We also allow, uh, allow a, a comp no, provide the possibility to ask questions uh, through the interweb. So just a second, I would like to check with the signal angels. Do we have any questions? Unfortunately not. So good for the gentleman in the first row. Uh, please ask your question. I have two, actually. Uh, so first of all, I, um, do I understand correctly that you will then use something like DNSSEC to set up trust with parties that you do not know? Yep. All right. A day, DNSSEC, DAIN, and TLS, usually. All right. Uh, question number two is, so SAML obviously is not another way for cross-realm authentication. Is that something that you compared with? I think of some of the problems with the SASL seems that you still are a man in the middle, which overcomplicates it a little bit, I think. If you do SAML, you completely redirect, and you just wait for the answer. Yeah, definitely. Um, if you log on to your email, you have to use SASL. So that's why we have three solutions, because sometimes a protocol says use Kerberos, use SASL, or use whatever else. Um, SAML can usually be included in a protocol, and among that, uh, there is a SAML mechanism for SASL. So given HTTP cells, you could actually put SAML in there. But I know it has an embedding in HTTP already, so that's senseless. Unless you want to give the client a choice. And I think that's valuable. Two, two questions. Line up yeah. at the end and ask a third question. Thank you. Next question, please. <laughs> so thanks for the talk. In your example, you said like we can um, give the authentication to the, the local provider, which may up the uh, security of the, of the user. Uh, but what if the local provider actually decreases uh, the security of the user, so the, 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 the web shop of whatever is in the middle actually doesn't want to provide your uh, local um, authentication party uh, because it's less secure than what they can offer themselves. Is there something there in the, um, in the protocol? You split my brain by using another term, and I'm not wondering whether you mean left or right. Um, are you talking about local authentication as in the quick diacessal receiving node that passes it over free diameter? Or are you talking about the identity provider that received the free diameter request? Okay, let me give an example. Like, I, if I log into my bank, I need to fill in my, 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 my username, password, and then do 2FA, for instance. Um, but what if my local provider only uses, like, uh, username and password? So my bank would actually say, no, you cannot use your local provider because it's less secure than what we can offer. Your bank wouldn't know. Your bank would only see who, as whom you logged on. And you are in control of the security of your bank account. I have an advice for you to do it well. <laughs> this, by the way, is very much what banks like because they are not interested in security. They are interested in covering their ass. True. 
And you're interested in getting the best security, probably but, better but than your bank also, was. Uh, um, Sorry. If, if it's, it's, it's it, it evolving yep. into a dialogue, yep. let me yep. cut this off here for a second. Da, 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 uh, yeah. Feel free to come back uh, um, or, yep. or to continue uh, this at the bar. Thanks. There's another question lined up, so please. Um. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, I have a question that's sort of usability related. Do you have any ideas on how to guide a user into which authentication method they should choose? Because choosing Digest MD5, I mean, I, you and he understands it, yeah, but yeah. my mom doesn't. No, but your mom probably has a system administrator who insists on particular practices. Uh, not yeah. really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of uh, co of I mean, course, we would, like to, uh, this, uh, we would like to encourage the user to use uh, crossover, when, uh, SS crossover whenever possible, because then you can use, uh, that's the only protocol currently which uses your own identity provider. And all the other protocols are normal, so to speak, eh? that the uh, authentication yeah. takes in the place in the same domain as the server. Yeah, and but I, I, you are, I think, also making the point that um, if you give people more freedom to choose, they okay. might shoot themselves the foot. Uh, and yeah. it, it's also, if you take email as an example, you don't usually configure in your email client which specific uh, authentication method you would like to use, your email client sort of chooses one that sort of makes Actually, sense. Actually, to some degree you do. Um, because it's SASL and you do say stuff that you won't allow over a, a plain text connections, for example. Um, yeah, but there are ways of setting these things and um, given that you have one option available or three and you, you basically what Sassel does it, it matches the overlap between the server offering and the client ability and finds a good one maybe the best one but if you're willing to accept all three options then it might choose any um, so yeah you would want to control this to some degree thank you yeah, thanks. I see a discussion group forming at the bar after yeah, the talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we uh, might get drunk if we don't before, care. Before we get to the next question on the mic, are, are there any questions on the interwebs for the speakers? Hello, uh, signal desk. Any questions? Nope. I see. I see shaking heads. So please go ahead. Uh, a very practical question. You mentioned the Apache web server. You mentioned Firefox. Obviously, there's no reason it couldn't work for other browsers, other web servers, right? Sorry, uh, um, there is an NGX implement implementation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I can answer yeah. the question. Uh, currently, uh, had us, uh, though there was some kind of standard uh, uh, being built for all browsers, and currently, you know, uh, there are only two real ones left. And uh, reality is Chrome and Chrome Contest Safari, currently even Internet Explorer and of course Chrome, Chrome itself, that's, that's, that's the, the one engine, and the only real other, other engine is still Firefox, and uh, in principle it is, uh, would have been possible to uh, implement this on, on Chrome as well, but there's one uh, addition which uh, Firefox added to the native, make, uh, native messaging, which involves that uh, uh, you can intercept HTTP requests, and then the fi Firefox browser plugin can wait uh, in the form of a so-called JavaScript promise for the answer of the external program on, uh, on, on a request. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Firefox is the only browser who implemented that. And, uh, Up to now. I mean, it is a standard. There's no reason why others couldn't. Yeah, it is, but there's it, no it, current use case. We define a use case, so we hope yeah, to and push that. We, we were very, very fortunate uh, that, uh, uh, that Firefox made that extension. Otherwise, I couldn't uh, create a demo which I created for, uh, for this, uh, not only crossover, but on, uh, the entire HTTP social and external program. That, uh, that, uh, we that, really wanted to pull credentials away from the browser. I somehow feel iffy when I need the same environment for looking at adverse advertisements and uh, logging on to my bank. So you want your credentials outside the that, browser that. and underneath the application, so in the HTTP layer. These were very deliberate choices. You could, of course, implement this entirely in uh, JavaScript, but then you wouldn't have access to Kerberos, for example, unless you build entire Kerberos in JavaScript, which might be a bit of a security problem. 
Um, did we answer your question? Yes, thank you very okay. much. Good. Long answer, but a good one. Thank you very much for that. We have, yes, please. Um, a, couple, a couple of quick ones. Uh, I was wondering about replay attacks. I didn't see any, any uh, binding into crypto protocols in here, or it, did I just miss it? I couldn't read all of the slides from back in there. Any Decently designed protocol, you have an explicit connection that wraps everything that goes on. HTTP made the choice to have independent packets that have no notion of a connection, no identity to link them, and you can send others in other connections. That is a big problem, and that we managed to get this secure. But the replay attack answer, because of this design, usually is use HTTPS. I'm sorry, the web doesn't have a better answer, so we don't either. Yeah, um, so that's actually why um, some of the newer uh, authentication uh, protocols tie the, um, um, the HTTPS parameters into the authentication. Um, it's, it's called universal second factor. UTF. And but anyway. Yeah, 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 in social terms, it will be channel binding, and we do that. Yeah. Okay, I, 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 can, I, I can elaborate a little bit on the implementation of crossover in HTTP social. Uh, and though HTTP itself is stateless, uh, we, uh, Rick introdu introduced the uh, uh, server to server token in the, in the, uh, the, HTTP, the HTTP headers, and uh, those. The implementation of crossover and diameter contains the so-called session ID, which uh, will be disposed by the diameter when the uh, session is complete. And so when you then try to replay that, uh, the, 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 if I'm correct, the diameter won't accept it because that session ID is no longer valid. Okay. I want to add the S2S. Yeah, this in our, most of our current implementations is not the real state of the, of the, of the server, but only an, uh, in the, in the, so to say indirect. Yeah, the, 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 it's uh, the session ID of a diameter session, yeah, but not a state which uh, uh, yeah, this, the authentication is currently in. Yeah. Because then you are totally correct when you do that. I even made a, a, a proof of concept of that because we would like to have the uh, headers, uh, for normal protocols, the HTTP server to be stateless, but then, then you can very clearly see the, 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 the indeed the risk of a replay attack, because of course that succeeds, eh? because then you don't have the challenge response system anymore, because you have all the state, uh, it doesn't matter whether the state is encrypted or not, you have all the state into the S2S, and then you can just replay the last pong, so to speak, uh, uh, to the, uh, you can replay that, and then you're om immediately locked in. Dus right. that, that, is, that is indeed uh, uh, quite a big problem. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, I found out, and uh, together with uh, uh, some guy uh, called Steph, which is, is really involved in this pro project, who pointed that out. Uh, so I proposed it to use it on his protocol, and came up with it. And the only way Perhaps we have to investigate it further, but the only way to circumvent it is indeed using uh, a, a secure protocol such as HTTP. Yeah. But he's right, it is not a complete answer to replay attacks. Um, and I do have to move that yeah. conversation over yeah. to the bar because okay. we are unfortunately out of time. I'm very sorry for that. So please give another yeah. last warm round of applause for Rick and Henry.